And I uh, will be reading also a little bit of the gospel lesson that I've decided at the last minute to share today. Beginning in verse 1 of chapter 5 of Romans. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to his grace in which we stand, and we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly, Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us, and that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Much more surely then, now that we have been justified by his blood, will we be saved through him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son, much more surely, having been reconciled, will we be saved by his life. But more than that, we even boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we now have received reconciliation. And then the gospel lesson today, I'm just going to read a verse, um, actually from the King James, in John chapter 4. And, and I'm just going to uh, begin in verse 5 there. He then came to the city of Samaria, Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the uh, partial ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now, Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, set thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. And there came of the woman of Samaria to draw water, and Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were going away into the city by me. Then said the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. And Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. And the woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou, for, art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself, and his children, and his cattle? And Jesus answered and said unto her, Whoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. Whoever drinketh of the water that I give shall never thirst again. But the water that I shall give him shall be a, to him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. He goes on, and Jesus tells her who he is when she asks questions. He tells her that he is the one who has been chosen. <clears throat> what a week it has been. Last Sunday, we knew and we had heard about this crazy virus. But those were just words to us in many ways. They were so far away. We knew that there was something taking place, but they were words. We hear lots of words. This week, the schools closed. The airlines halted service in many places, and the government began to look seriously at this virus. And lots of words were spoken all week. Lots of lots of words. But here is the issue. One doesn't have to search very far in our culture to realize that we live in an age that we just don't trust words very much. We hear so much. We use words by the bushel. In fact, this is the age that does word processing. Even that's a weird thing when you think about it. Even so, we don't trust words. We listen to the news and we say they're talking heads. We listen to others speak and we don't put a lot of weight on it because their words can be slippery or weaselly things trying to conceal or, uh, conceal or to deceive or to distort. Words are cheap, and people hide behind words. When a politician gives a speech, what do you say often when you listen to it? It doesn't matter what kind of political person it is. You say, promises, promises, promises. 
When the cable man says, I'm going to be by to fix your cable up around 2 o'clock on Thursday, what do you say? You can't count on that. <laughs> he may never make it at that time. When we're told we have everything under control, we just don't trust, do we? We raise a skeptical eyebrow because we've heard so many times in our life, words. Just words. Rhetoric. Talk. Words. We don't trust them. Words are sneaky. Talk is cheap. We don't want words, really. We want substance. As Eliza Doolittle says to her two suitors in My Fair Lady, I won't do it in a British accent, believe me, she says, uh, is that all you bladders can do? Don't talk of burning ab of the stars burning above. If you're in love, show me. Or as some have said, I'm comfortably closer to home to preachers. I'd rather see a sermon than hear a sermon. Any day, at any time. The distrust of words is nothing new, of course. It's always been there almost from the very beginning. According to the story of Adam and Eve, the situation begins to deteriorate in Eden is precisely at the moment when the serpent begins to raise the possibility that the words that Jesus said might not be all that they seem. He said, did God say, did God say you will die? No, those are just words, he said, you will not die. At the dawn of creation, words were given as a gift from God. Animals made sounds. But human beings formed words, potentially full of meaning and truth. Words were, in a sense, really, and I don't want to sound irreligious here, but they were the first sacramental elements of communion. Whatever else we lost in Eden, we lost the trustworthy, the trustworthiness of language. Men and women became afraid. And because they became afraid, they began to hide. They begin to hide from God, and they begin to hide from each other, behind fig leaves and behind lying words. Where is your brother? I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? Now, all of this should give us some concern, since the things that we are called to do as Christians are done basically with words. Financiers have capital. Physicians have medicine. Farmers have seed and soil. Soldiers have guns. And we as Christians, we have words. Words, words, words. Prayer words. Worship words. Sermon words. Words of hope. Words of protest. Words of praise. Where there is grief, there are words of comfort. Where there is complacency and apathy, there are challenging words. Words. Words, words. That's why it's important to hear the claim of the gospel of Jesus Christ in the book of John. That's why it's important to read what Paul says in the epistle of Romans. In Christ, we get our words back. That the words we speak can become filled once again with grace and truth, renewed with instruments of redemption. That's part of the story that Jesus and the woman of the well that I read in John is all about. What did Jesus really do for this woman? He didn't heal her any disease. She didn't come ill. He didn't raise her child from the dead. She didn't have a child that needed raising. He didn't dazzle her by taking the water and turning into wine. She just simply wanted water to drink. He simply used words and talked to her. That's all. Words, words, words. But the words he spoke were so radically different from the other words she had heard. Words so filled with grace and truth that she was never the same again. It's important to note that this story does not begin with words. Really, to the contrary, it begins in silence. Not gentle, tranquil silence, but hard, cold silence. Because she who comes to the well was a Samaritan. And he who rested on the well was a Jew. She who came to the well was a woman. And he who rested on the well was a man. Between Samaritan women and Jewish man, there was a wall of silence. You did not breach that wall. You did not talk to one another. 
It was built brick by brick with prejudice and hatred. And through no, through that wall, no word was allowed to pass. And this Jewish man says to the Samaritan woman, Would you give me a drink of water? And the wall came tumbling down with words. One word, one seemingly ordinary phrase, a quiet word that cut against the grain of culture, and the walls came tumbling down. It's amazing how very significant moments in the church's ministry and in the work of grace in our lives take place, not in very dramatic ways, but sometimes in small words. Sometimes, of course, there is sensational confrontation with Caesar or the thrilling turnaround of faith, but most of the time, ministry, and we as a church who do ministry, it's something like the quiet speaking of a single word the quiet action in a small way. Like in 1955, when a bus driver in Montgomery, Alabama ordered four people in the row of seats to move to a backward bus. It is said that one of those people, a department store clerk named Rosa Parks, spoke so softly, it was hard to hear her voice over the noise of the bus. But what she said was, no. And a wall came tumbling down. Minister tells about a young woman who was a member of the congregation she served. After college, she entered a pharmacy school. And from that time, she came to home and worshiped every Sunday while she was in school. One Sunday evening after one of her visits, the minister received a telephone call from her father. And the father was very upset. He said, my daughter just called. She went back to pharmacy school and she just called with the news that she suddenly decided to drop out of pharmacy school. And what the minister asked, what could have possibly created such a decision? The father said, I have no idea. I asked my daughter and, 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 and she didn't tell me and I've asked her to come home and talk to you. Well, when the minister did talk to the young woman, he expressed shock that she would decide to forfeit her hard work that she'd been thinking about all along, throwing it all away. How in the world, he said, did you come to that decision? And she said, well, it was your sermon yesterday that started me thinking. She said, she went on to describe how in the theme of the sermon, he talked about that God calls everyone to ministry, that God had some service for every Christian to do. And she said that I realized that I was in pharmacy school for the selfish reasons that I wanted a career rather than to serve God. She said, I begin to remember a wonderful summer spent working as part of the church mission program, teaching children of migrant workers, and how I felt that I was truly serving God. So after hearing the sermon that uh, yesterday morning, she said, I've decided to dedicate my life to working with underprivileged children. There was a long silence on the minister's end of the, uh, the conversation. He said, well, now look, I was just preaching. Those were words, 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 sermon words, words of the call of God. For her, the walls came tumbling down. They were words that changed her life. When the wall fell down between Jesus and this woman, she seemed startled, perhaps even frightened. There's something comforting about a wall, really. It, it kind of hems us in. But at least we don't have to face what's on the other side. We build a fence between us and our neighbors, something. It doesn't have to be physical. It can be just we don't want to talk to them. We don't want to see them. We don't have to know what goes on in their life. Nor do they have to know what goes on in our life. So in shock, when the wall falls between us, we're at a loss of words. Beneath the words, Jesus hears the person. In the windstorm of her words, Jesus hears this woman. Why is it that you, a Jew, would ask me, a Samaritan, for water? If you knew the gift of God, he said, you could have asked, and I would have given you living water. Who do you think you are, she said. You haven't even got a bucket. Even Jacob had to have a bucket. How are you going to be doing something greater than Jacob? How could you be greater than Jacob? And here in your need, Jesus makes an offer. 
Everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again, but those who drink of the water that I give will never be thirsty. It was then that the woman said the fatal word, the word that had caused the death of her old self and the beginning of a new life. Give me this water so that I will never be thirsty, she says. All right, Jesus says, go get your husband. I have no husband. That's right, you have no husband, Jesus says. You've had five husbands, and the one you're with now is not your husband. You told the truth. You have no husband. Now, let me stop here for just a moment. Commentators and preachers for centuries have raised their eyebrows about this woman, as if she is some kind of divorcee like Liz Taylor going out and marrying people left and right in Samaria, trading husbands like sports cars. But in all of their moral words, they missed the point that the women of the first century did not have that option. She was not devouring husband after husband. She had been devoured by a system that was destroying her life. She had been passed from man to man to man until no longer she even had the dignity of marriage in her life. Jesus is not so much exposing her sin as he's saying to you, you have been subjected to law. And with a word, he has touched the issue that is in her life, in her heart, in her soul. I love the story I read about a young pastor in a small church in the South. The church was small enough so that this pastor, she set herself the goal of visiting every family on the roll for the first six months. And at the end of six months, she had almost done it. She had visited every family but one. People say, well, they haven't been here in two years. Don't bother, they are coming back. We've all said that, haven't we? She set her goal, though. And on one afternoon, she drove out to their house. Only the wife was at home. She poured cups of coffee, and they sat in the kitchen table, and they chatted. They talked about this, and they talked about that. They talked about everything. They talked about lots of stuff. And she heard the story that two and a half years earlier, this woman said she had been home with her young son. She was vacuuming in the back of the bedroom but hadn't checked on him in a while, so she stepped off the vacuum and went to the den. Couldn't find him. She followed his trail around the den, through the patio door, across the patio, to the swimming pool, where she found him. At the funeral, our friends at the church were very kind, she said. They told us it was God's will. The minister put down her cup on the table. She should touch it or she should not. She'd been touched. Your friends met well, I'm sure, but they were wrong. What do you mean, she said? I mean that God does not will the death of children. The woman's face got red and her jaw set. Then who do you blame? I guess you blame me. No. I don't blame you. I don't want to blame God either. Then how do you explain it? Her anger rising. I don't know. I can't explain it. I don't understand why such things happen. I only know that God's heart broke and you are still there. The woman had her arms crossed. That's a pretty clear, clear indication. This conversation is over. And the minister left the house kicking herself. Why didn't I leave it alone? Why did I have to speak those words? A few days later, the phone rang. It was that woman. We don't know where this is going, but would you come out and talk with my husband and me? We have assumed that God was angry at us. Maybe it's the other way around. With a word to touch the issue of people's lives, Jesus named an issue in her life. The woman tried to change the subject, this woman at the well. When Jesus touched the subject, she said, uh, I see that you're a prophet. Now, let's see, what's a prophet like in theology, isn't it? Interesting, you Jews worship in Jerusalem and we Samaritans worship on them. Don't you love it when you touch on the word, we change the subject so very often? Maybe you'd like to talk about eschatology, she said. Maybe we need to talk about other stuff. Jesus said, woman, I tell you, the hour is coming, and now it is, when the mountain, the temple, it won't make any difference. What will make a difference is you, your worship in spirit and in truth. 
me make a difference to God? When hell freezes over, when the Messiah comes, and that's when Jesus said the best word of all, I am he. The one who, with the word, breaks down the walls. The one with the word touches the deepest wounds of our life. I am he. In the beginning was the word, the word became flesh, and dwelt among us. Full of grace, and full of truth. I am he. Jesus was the word. And because of that word, she was transformed by that word. She who had been locked in silence and shame, left that place with a word to live and a word to speak. She said, come and see a man who told me everything. I've ever done. Could this be the Messiah? I hate hearing the phone ring late at night or early morning. <coughs> Oftentimes when it does, I hear a voice on the other side say things, particularly if, if it's Baptist, they call me preacher. They say, preacher, I wait to call as long as I can, but mom or dad or my wife or my daughter, whomever it might be, just <coughs> passed away. Could you come and say a few words? Hard words to hear. What they do not know, could not know, is how I prayerfully, not in some holy voice, but in some time, terrified way, say, Lord, what in the world am I going to say? What in the world can I do? In my poor human beingness, I desperately am trying to find some words of meaning brought by the grace of God through the presence of Christ. And in God's presence and in those words, 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 there is living truth and there is hope. And because the word becomes flesh and dwells among us, we face what we must face. Now I say all that this morning, I changed from that Romans passage, talking about peace, to say that we face tomorrows. We are stuck with with our fears, but we're to venture out into faith, in the tempest of confusion and hurt, and we try to find something, anything, gracious to say to people in need. The promise is that by the mercy of God, our frail words become the earthen vessels for the word so desperately needed, and that word is the Christ. So will it be for all of us the truth? It is the Christ. We need to speak comfort. We need to speak support. We need to help people who are frightened. Be with people who are worried. Speak truth to those who have uncertainty. But we have truth. We have hope. We know the master in our lives. And it's not just about words we say. Not cheap words. It's about words we live. And words we do actions we take. It's not about us. It's about who we share and how we share it. Please be aware that you are called to be givers of good news. The Old Testament, or the, the old church nerd, that is we are called to be people of the gospel, which means good news. We are people of good news. That is the word we take out this day. No matter where or what or faith, but to other states, we are bearers of good news. Let us pray. Hear us now, Lord, I pray. Help us as we struggle this day. Struggle with what is taking place, and let us move beyond just words to truly caring and loving and sharing. Let us move beyond just saying things, but doing things. Let's move beyond just playing things and actually being things. Through the power of your word, the power of your hope, the power of who you are. Hear our prayers this day, Lord, we pray. In Christ's name, amen. Let's look at our bulletin this morning and let us share from our heart our affirmation of faith. You may not have to look, you may know about memory. Please stand as we share together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. 
He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and set us on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. <laughs>